I'd like you to think back to the last time that you experienced this sociological phenomenon called the wave. <laughs> now, I'm not talking about the Darien High School mascot. Maybe you were a part of the wave, maybe you simply saw it, but it is an amazing thing. You sit in a stadium or to some kind of event and you see it starting to go around. And when it gets to you, you stand up and go, woo! <laughs> and then you sit down and watch it go the rest of the way. The last one I was in was last month at Rutgers Athletic Center watching a basketball game. It always amazes me. Now, maybe you need to understand that I was a sociology major in high school, or in college. And during the first few years that Ruthie and I were married, we lived with a family where the husband was a psychology professor. And so we would sit from time to time and talk about the wave while we sat at Fenway Park and watched the Red Sox play. And we'd see the wave start to go and we'd say, well, what would it be like to do a PhD focusing on the dynamics of the wave? <laughs> Exactly. You know, I thought about having the whole congregation go like that, and I wasn't sure whether you'd go for it or not. But Well, listen, you know, I read an article this week entitled The Stadium Wave and the Study of Social Sociological Phenomena. You can't make this stuff up. It stated that a phenomenon is any observed action event or situation, like a hurricane, a birthday party, or an economic recession, and that so social phenomena are observed actions, events, or situations that are created by society as opposed to occurring naturally. Think about what happens in a grocery store the night before a nor'easter. <laughs> now they got a bunch of physicists to take a look at the action of a wave. And they examined what happened uh, in the dynamics of the wave in, a large so in large soccer stadiums, and they found two things. More often than not, a wave travels in a clockwise direction. And second, a wave travels at 20 seats per second. <laughs> now, you might be wondering, why is it that John's telling us about this on Palm Sunday? Well, hang in there. The article notes that the consistency of what happens is fascinating. And they pose a question, how can fans who have never met share these similar qualities? They conclude they can't. The wave is a phenomenon. It isn't the people, but an action or an event that happens between people. Think about what happened on Palm Sunday when the people entered in and saw Jesus and what they did. This morning we will continue our series just saying, but instead of looking at an I am statement this morning, we want to take a look at the crowd. Who did they say Jesus was? And as is our custom, I'd invite you to take off your shoes as we read the scripture and listen to the sermon. And we don't do this to make ourselves comfortable. We do this to make ourselves attentive to who God is because God is present with us. And this is a holy moment. And so I would ask you to turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 12, beginning at verse 12. Listen to God's word. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first his disciples did not understand all this. 
Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, that together they might be acceptable in your sight, for you are the very rock and redeemer of our lives. Lord, help us to hear your word, to know your truth, that we might be set free, free to walk with you and to obey you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Getting caught in a crowd. It was pretty easy to get caught in the crowd in Jerusalem at that time especially during a Jewish festival. It was Passover, a time where they celebrated coming out of a land of slavery in Egypt on their way to the Promised Land. God led them through the waters of the Red Sea. And during Passover, pilgrims would come to Jerusalem to celebrate what God did. The Jewish historian Josephus estimates that there were 2.7 million people in Jerusalem that year. 2.7 million. Does that seem kind of large? Most scholars would agree with you. In fact, they say that they think this number is an exaggeration. However, they are also quick to say that the number of people in Jerusalem would swell during Passover and any other Jewish festival. Verse 12 of our text notes that there was a great crowd. They came to see Jesus. Why? If you look back to verse 9, you see that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And when they heard that, they came to see Jesus. Jesus, by his words and actions, has attracted great crowds. And some of those people in those crowds came to believe in him. And sociological phenomena did happen when crowds in Jesus' time gathered, much like they happen in crowds today. Remember, the city of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel together were under foreign domination by Rome. When they gathered together to celebrate Passover, they remembered God's power in delivering them from a foreign nation. Some people would consider at that point, maybe this is the time that God will deliver us from Rome. The number of people who came into the city as it swelled became a threat to the Romans. And historians record various uprisings and protests and even several riots that occurred in and around Jerusalem during Passover. When crowds gather and people are caught up in them, there's always the potential for something to happen. Think Times Square, New Year's Eve. Tens of thousands of people packed into a small area. And the security threat begins to rise. Think March Madness. Tens of thousands of people cram into arenas and you don't know what's going to happen. Think yesterday. In cities around our nation, when students gathered to march the march for our lives. And we're being told that that number of students have not gathered together to protest since the Vietnam War. 
whatever happens, has the potential to be positive or negative. And we judge whether it's positive or negative depending on our perspective. And that's just what happened in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. There was a welcome for the one who was seen as a king. And there were a whole assortment of reactions and responses in the crowd that day. The reaction of the crowd was quite remarkable. The great crowd gathered into Jerusalem and they brought palms and they waved them. And what they did with them indicated how they understood what had happened. They said, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna literally means to save, to deliver. But we're told that at this time in history, that word became more of a word of praise, especially as it's coupled with the other part of the phrase, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Why is the one who comes in the name of the Lord blessed? Because that person who comes is coming to Jerusalem to celebrate a festival. Marianne Mai Thompson in her commentary on John says, what's interesting here is the phrase, the one who comes. This phrase is used often for a deliverer, a prophet, or a king. And here, the people call Jesus king. Earlier on in the Gospel of John, when Jesus fed the 5,000 people, they wanted to take him as king by force and he would not allow it and yet here the response of Jesus is clear he accepts this title but he didn't come as a conquering king on a war horse he didn't come as a nationalistic leader he came and found himself on a donkey he fulfilled scripture he came as a king but not exercising physical strength or military power. He came as a king by being a servant. And the response of the Pharisees? Well, let's just say it was probably one of despair. This whole procession that was happening with the palms being waved and clothes being put on the on the ground before Jesus? Yeah, that was not going their way. They say the whole world was going after him. This is not good for the Pharisees. They could control things and they wanted to control things to go their way. They even made an alliance with the Romans to see if they could take care of Jesus and get this threat gone. And we see that the Jewish leaders plotted to kill Jesus. Now the response of Jesus' followers is interesting here in verse 16. It's not one of understanding what's going on. They didn't get it. It's only after Jesus is glorified, that is after his death and resurrection, that they began to understand what was happening. And I think we're much like them. If we don't see this in context of 20, 000, or 2,000 years of history, we miss it. When we see what's happening is when we can welcome the one who comes as the ultimate king. Now, how do we make sense of all this? We make sense of it by seeing it in context. The passages in John's gospel, this passage in John's gospel is nestled between Jesus' anointing and his prediction of his death and resurrection. This is no mistake. The people came after Jesus because they heard about what happened with Lazarus. Just before our passage this morning, it mentions that. In our passage, it mentions that. The passage is framed by what happened to Lazarus. And then it is followed by Jesus 
predicting his death and resurrection. It's clear that Jesus is the one who has authority over life and death. Jesus' words and actions all along point to Jesus' authority and his identity. As the bread of life, he provides food for those who are hungry in a deserted place where there are scarce resources. And he takes five loaves and two fish. He feeds 5,000 people. As the light of the world, he is the one who is able to illuminate the darkness. As the gate, he provides a place of entry into life. As the good shepherd, he provides care and oversight for those who would follow him. And as the way, the truth, and the life, he opens up the way to the Father, which is filled with truth and filled with life. This King, King Jesus, doesn't abandon any of those who would follow him. He enters Jerusalem to the shouts of Hosanna and to the waving of palms. And as he does, he walks through the events of the week. The clearing of the temple, the teaching of his closest followers, the sharing of a powerful, powerful meal. As people walk across the palms, this king endures betrayal, arrest, <coughs> denial, and a trial. As people crunch on those palms, this king experiences crucifixion, death, and burial. We know that that is not the end of the story. But don't miss the drama of the week. Don't jump from Palm Sunday to Easter and miss everything in between. You see, the joy of Easter is made even more joyful as we walk through the tomb with Jesus. But we're not there yet. With the crowds, let us welcome the one who is the ultimate king. What happened that day in the streets of Jerusalem may well have been a sociological phenomenon. It may have been a celebration. It may have been a threat. It may have been a cause for misunderstanding. But the reality of that day and the events of that week are real. The events that were set in motion on Palm Sunday have changed the history of the world in which we live. They impact our lives now as we seek to follow Jesus. So don't allow the events of that week, don't allow the events of this week to pass you by. I invite you to take your pick of the four Gospels and read through the passages of Holy Week. I invite you to carve out some time in your life this week and worship here on Thursday evening, or worship at St. Luke's. St. Luke's. Uh, down, I know where I'm going. I've, I've got to be there. <laughs> worship at St. Luke's on Friday, or do both. Spend some time meditating on who Jesus is and was. Spend some time grieving on Saturday as his original followers did, not knowing what was to come. We began Lent on Ash Wednesday by imposing ashes on foreheads in the shape of a cross and saying, from dust you came, to death you will return. As we come into the last week of this journey, I want to invite you to do something to keep it in the forefront. In each of the pews on the center aisle, you'll find a bag with black wristbands. The wristbands are engraved with the word Friday. I invite you to take one and pass them along the pew. 
wear it on your wrist. If you don't want to do that, put it in a place where you will see it multiple times during the day so that you can remember. Use it as a reminder of what happened. Use it as a reminder of what's coming. May it be a reminder of who Jesus was and is. A reminder of His call to each one of us to follow Him, to walk with Him, even through the grave. We know what's coming. Next week, wear your wristband and we'll exchange it just as Jesus, Jesus exchanged life for death. We know what's coming. But today and this week, welcome the one who is the ultimate king. Ride on, King Jesus. Ride on. Nobody works like him. No one will deter him. No one will hinder him. Ride on, King Jesus. In majesty. Just saying.